Hello again. Well, you know, I have to apologize for last time. I kind of cut you short. Uh, I was expecting two more slides uh, to appear, but I didn't have the uh, PowerPoints uh, selected correctly. So you probably saw me at the end kind of fumbling around and you saw a dark screen and you were saying, hmm, this is interesting. He didn't sign off. Uh, well, that's because I was expecting two more slides. And I wasn't going to go back uh, after 30 minutes and redo everything, and I couldn't add to the end, so I just said, "Well, that's just got to got to be the way it's going to be." So I just left it there. But anyway, so I apologize for cutting you off, and you're probably wondering, "Well, what's going on?" Well, that was the end, uh, as you kind of figured out. But uh, we're back again. We're going to try to do her again this time and uh, get her better. So what we're going to do, we've been talking about digestion, absorption, talking a lot about the digestive system, and you hear a lot these days about gastrointestinal problems. Um, it could be celiac disease, it could be irritable bowel syndrome, it could be inflammatory bowel disease, uh, it could be an allergy, it could be several things that deal with the intestinal system, but um, you just hear a lot about it. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is looking at those those types of health concerns, okay? But first, uh, you know, when I go back home, I you know, what the, the old adage is, I put my redneck on. Uh, you know, when I'm in Gresham, I don't put my redneck on, but when I go back to Mosier, um, I do that. So uh, I wanted to just uh, let you see... Uh, what we do with our spare time uh, as rednecks. Uh, I left this in your PowerPoints because I figured you'd maybe want to be a redneck or if you have some spare time when you're not studying, maybe this will entertain you. So let me show you how this works. So if we go here, um, uh, what we'll find is that we can take this here and we'll grab it and we're going to try to get this fly see we got him so we got another one see we're good see, I got two at once but they keep coming You guys are quick. Anyway, okay, enough of that. So I left that in there so you guys could maybe have something to do in your spare time, or uh, you know, if your kids are bothering you, maybe you could uh, put them to entertain them for hours doing this. So anyway, gastrointestinal health concerns. Um, a lot of undiagnosed health concern, gastrointestinal health concerns. The problem is a lot of symptoms don't fit a diagnosis, uh, and so you'll find that a lot of physicians won't diagnose gastrointestinal health concerns because it doesn't really fit. They don't really know, and they don't want to, you know, have you pay for a test that uh, may not show anything. So that's the problem: is that the diagnosis is not clear. Um, and so uh, you really have to, sometimes you have to demand a uh, test or go to a physician that deals with health, health gastrointestinal problems and have them uh, see if they can diagnose it. But there are a lot of undiagnosed problems in this country that they really don't know what the problem is, but they continue having them. So let's just go through a few and just give you a, a flavor because there's a lot of ones that you hear about and just give you uh, a heads up, I guess, better than flavor. I don't know where that came from, but a heads up on some of these problems. Now, an allergy um, is going to be when you have a reaction to food. And the way that you would uh, know that is because your body's going to pr produce antibodies against it. Uh, so it can be tested and, you know, they can do the little studies where they give you different 
products and see if your body reacts to them uh, in your immune system would attack the proteins there so they can do these allergy studies um, to do that. But normally the symptoms happen pretty quickly. Uh, normally happens the second time you're exposed to the allergen uh, because the first time you're, if you don't have that um, system set up, then then your body has to set up the immune system uh, to attack this. Um, uh, I'm going to see if I can get the light come back on here again. Uh, I feel better today, so I can stand up and get it going. Um, anyway, so if you create antibodies and you get something like a rash or, you know, it can get pretty bad anaphylaxis. Uh, but in, in normal uh, allergies, it, it, the first time you're exposed, you don't get the rash, or any, but the second time you do. But if they do the test and you've already been exposed uh, because you've got a rash, then it should show up uh, as a, an allergy. But anyway, so, you know, what you'd be looking for is a rash like this uh on your skin you'd be looking for inflammation some rash back in here and then the ultimate would be and this is the most interesting picture i have would be when you start uh, really puffing up and swelling up and looking like this i mean this guy is in bad shape uh kind of looks like uh mick jagger like thing anyway um i hope mick doesn't uh take my class um, so that's an allergy. Uh, food intolerance is a is different. It's a sensitivity. It doesn't have to produce uh, antibodies or anything like that, but it's just an adverse reaction of some kind to food. Uh, it could be like uh, when you have lactose intolerance, then you just don't produce the enzyme to digest the the food, and so it gets into your large intestines, and you know the bacteria work on it. Uh, or it could be a food chemical, something, some kind of chemical that's in there that's not really an allergy. So, again, you wouldn't produce the antibodies, but your body is sensitive. There is a reaction to it, uh, and so you can get diarrhea, you can get cramps and headaches and things like that. But that's it. So there is a difference between an allergy and an intolerance. Uh, some people say they have an allergy because they get cramps and stuff, but usually that's not the symptoms. Um, it's it's an intolerance to food, so there is a difference there. Irritable bowel syndrome is something that you do hear about, um, but uh, the problem with uh, irritable bowel syndrome is they really don't know what causes it. It could be a multiple of things that could cause it, uh, and so uh, it's very hard to diagnose. Um, and um, it can cause abdominal pain. As you can see, alteration in bowel movements, which basically means sometimes you can have diarrhea, sometimes you can have constipation, uh, and they can they can appear uh, frequently. Uh, so it's not like you would have diarrhea and then two months later you have constipation. It's kind of more frequent than that. So you alter the consistency of your waste. But the red flag is, and what that means is, when should you become concerned, is if this keeps going on for three months, then you would not want to go in and get diagnosed for irritable bowel syndrome and see if they can, can figure it out and see if there's a problem there. But again, it's very hard to diagnose, so they would just basically ask you a lot of questions and they could do some uh, uh, intestinal checks and things like that. But a lot of it has to do with you have spasm, uh, spasming, I guess that's a word, uh, in your intestines, and that's what gives you the, the pain and the, that kind of thing. And then this, if you're spasming, then it's hard to get the peristalsis to going, and you can get constipation or, you know, whatever. Um, so that is uh, one of the, the symptoms of that, but how, you know, it's hard to diagnose a spasm unless you go to the doctor and you're actually having one uh, kind of a thing. So it's it's fairly, I mean, it's regular but irregular in that it doesn't just go every five minutes kind of thing, but it, uh, anyway. 
One of the things that, uh, from a nutritional standpoint, that they would recommend is a diet that follows what's called FODMAPs. And so the FODMAPs an acronym for different things. Uh, what they would be looking for is that you would uh, reduce in your food intake would be any, anything that's fermentable because then the bacteria would ferment it in some of the, what they believe is some of the byproducts of fermentation would cause that. Uh, oligosaccharides, remember they're fermentable. We talk about oligo, the fructans and, and those kinds of things if they're fermentable. So you'd want to reduce foods that would uh, possibly have oligosaccharides in it. So things that would produce gas, so like broccolis and cauliflowers and things could be a possibility. Uh, or, you know, legumes could be obviously an obvious one that would uh, be a possibility. Lactose, you know, diet, the D is for lactose. So you might, uh, but I mean, these are things that you would try to reduce and then they might do uh, a tolerance thing where they would, you know, you'd reduce everything else but add milk back uh, to your diet and see if lactose is a problem. Uh, and so if, if you're reducing everything else and you feel fine and you're not getting the symptoms, then you add lactose and you get the symptoms, then that's obviously a biggie. So you would, you would take away the lactose and then maybe you would add some legumes. And if nothing happens over a period of time, then legumes are not your problem. So they can reintroduce um, uh, some foods, you know, in time. But the first thing I would do is to follow this FODMAP diet uh, and then when the symptoms go away, maybe you could reintroduce a little bit at a time to see if we can isolate it to one problem. Monosaccharides like fructose can cause some problems, some gas and things, some diarrhea possibly uh, if you don't um, break it down. And then polyol, so sugar alcohols that you find in like sugarless gums or something like that or some diet things. So you'd be looking for sorbitol, xylitol, those kinds of things. So the goal, if you, uh, if, if there's a possibility you have IBS, then they may, a dietitian may recommend following the FODMAP diet. And, um, they, you know, they do allow a little bit in in there, 0.5 grams per sitting, so you can uh, have a little bit during the day, but drastically reducing what you would normally eat. So they do have, you know, lists of what are FODMAPs. So these would be the foods that you would want to start reducing if you think you have irritable bowel syndrome. So anything with milk, so lactose, anything with fructose that would be high and there's a fruit tans, so a lot of fruit and vegetables, those kinds of things that can have fruit tans and polyols would be these. So, and then these would be the things that you could eat. So you would just kind of follow a diet that would be mostly food map friendly um, or FODMAP, food map, food map, FODMAP friendly. So, so this would be a possibility for that. As far as inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, uh, a common one you hear about is Crohn's disease. It's also idiopathic, but it's an autoimmune disorder, it means that the body is going to attack itself. Some of the symptoms are bloody diarrhea, weight loss, anemia, cramping, inflammation, so it goes all over the board. But the inflammation piece is going to be the key. So if they do an intestinal check and find inflammation, whereas irritable bowel syndrome really doesn't uh, have the inflammation as much as more of the spasming kind of thing. But um, this infl inflammation can actually, in, in case, some cases, can go all the way from the mouth all the way down to the colon. You can have inflammation. Uh, but normally it is isolated to the intestines and, and normally <clears throat> the, the small intestines where um, you could get this, but can go into the large intestines and you get bloody diarrhea, you know, all kinds of different things. So it's, it's much more severe than um, the irritable bowel syndrome as far as the symptoms 
that kind of thing. So here be the example. Here's healthy, and then you can see the inflammation where you have an inflamed colon there. So yeah, pretty obvious there if you have Crohn's disease. So they can check that fairly easy. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder, but they pretty much can isolate it to gluten. But it's not the, the, the whole gluten. Gluten is something that is found in wheat, and it's uh, a protein uh, that uh, is important in wheat because it's a, kind of elastic. And so uh, you would add gluten to like bread because when the bread rises, then it won't break. The gluten allows it to rise and expand without breaking. Um, and then it would go flat. So you have gluten in breads and things like that for the for um, if you add yeast and you want it to rise. Uh, and uh, but only one second. Part of the gluten can be digested, but it's the gliadin that is going to um, cause the problem because they are there are antibodies against it that are going to cause inflammation and actually destruction of the villi and make actually the, the small intestines more like the large intestines it's going to flatten them out and as we talked about when we were doing absorption if you don't have those villi there uh, to capture the nutrients uh, then a lot of nutrients will go into the waste and so if, the, if you destroy the villi, absorption of nutrients is going to be limited, so you could get a nutrition deficiency of that. But the problem with celiac disease is, is um, there's three possibilities that I have listed here. Classical, I mean, if it's classical, then you know you've got it. Uh, but atypical means you may have mild symptoms and you, it just, you know, they don't happen often, so you don't really know. Uh, you kind of think you might, but it's not the full-blown uh, classical. And then it can be silent also, um, where, uh, you know, it doesn't show the classical symptoms. So there's all possibilities. So I'm sure there's, and I don't have any data, but there's a lot of people walking around that have the silent uh, type that you would never know. I mean, you do fear irritable, and but you may just think you're tired, or you think it's it's uh, maybe even an allergy or something like that uh, is part of your disorder. But anyway, um, the um, what happens is, and this is where the gliadin comes in, is that the gliadin is once the gluten is partially digested, and you have the gliadin, it can get through in between the the cells of the intestinal system get in there and basically uh, I'm not going to have you know all this per se but it gets in there and starts uh, causing your um, immune system to produce T helper T cells and things that will basically cause an antibody against gluten uh, or mainly the gliadin and then it's going to affect your your intestinal cells and destroy the microvilli um, in the villi there and so this is another one just kind of a lot of reaction but basically what you can see is here's the brush border of the villi uh, and the microvilli and then you destroy that uh, brush border and reduces uh, how uh, how you absorb nutrients but also it's, you know, obviously can be painful and that kind of thing so what is the diagnosis the only real known diagnosis to see is to do an intestinal biopsy, and basically what they would they would uh, look for is uh, flattened celiac villi. So you you don't have the uh, normal villi there; it's just flattened there. The diet approach is going to be gluten free. If you're diagnosed with celiac disease, then you have to go gluten free. Um, and here is, you know, just a, a list of allowed foods. Now, obviously, there's more than this, but I just giving you the idea that, um, you know, wheat for sure that is going to be a problem. And so these are foods to avoid, um, but also some barley, rye, triticale um, is going to be a problem. Um, <clears throat> possible wheat foods and processed foods that might have uh, wheat or barley or rye. 
So you're pretty much limited to these. I mean, it's not a total loss. I mean, you can still have legumes and rice and that kind of thing. So you'd have to use rice flours or legume flours and, and those kinds of things. But um, it does limit, you know, when you're going out to, to eat and things like that, you have to be careful. And, you know, you have to be careful with foods that are cooked with, you know, they, they may, may say, oh, we don't have wheat in our product. But if they cooked it in the same place that they had wheat, you can get some there. And it's like anything else. Some people are more sensitive than other ones. And so just a little bit of gluten may cause some people to just go you know, their their systems uh, go crazy and other people can have a lot and um, it, you know, more and it, it doesn't bother them as much, but they it does bother them over time. So there are different degrees of celiac disease. It just depends on how sensitive your system is to it. But there are a lot of, uh, especially important, quite a few bakeries pro cropping up that are gluten free that you can get some stuff at. So downtown Portland, and um, I believe that there's one in Gresham that deals with gluten-free products. Can't remember exactly the name, but it's down on uh, Powell and down in Gresham area. Uh, <clears throat> so um, anyway, but just these, so these are kind of the ones you'll hear about. I just wanted to introduce those just so that when you hear them, you kind of have an idea of what we're talking about here. But since we're talking about the digestive system, you uh, uh, want to be careful. So I thought this was kind of appropriate that this vehicle may be transporting political promises. And it's a poo pumper, <laughs> kind of a cool license plate, the poo pumper or the poop pumper. Uh, I don't know. But uh, anyway, so I'll try to sign off a little bit better today. So if it's uh, if you're tired, then I will allow you to take a nap. All right. All right. So we'll see you next time.